Hello, friends. This is Jan Curcio, back with Breaking Bread for You, with a study on the story of Jesus of Nazareth's encounter with the accusers of an unnamed woman said to have been caught in the act of adultery. Only recorded in the Gospel of John, this story has been the subject of many sermons, books, and articles, with most concluding that it's an illustration of Jesus's mercy and forgiveness. Yet it is to be asked, was that the actual message John wanted to convey? Whatever that might be, it is to be agreed with 12th century church scholar Eustathios of Thessalonica that the account of the woman caught in the act of adultery is a great pearl of the gospel. And let me interject here that this story is not found in the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament that we have today, possibly having been added to John's gospel later on by an unknown editor from an unknown source perhaps from a lost gospel. Yet there remains the possibility that the story had been written by John after all, whether he had included it in his gospel at the beginning of chapter eight or in another writing altogether. It has been suggested that an editor removed it from John's gospel for whatever reason, but that later on it was put back by another editor who recognized its relevance to the surrounding material of chapters seven and eight. The story of the woman caught in adultery well supports John's emphasis of the truth of Jesus's identity against the rejection of it by not only the scribes and Pharisees, but his own brothers in chapter seven. That ends with Nicodemus's defense of Jesus's right by law to a legal hearing, Deuteronomy 17, six, which the adulteress had been denied. And following her story is the heated dialogue between Jesus and the Pharisees concerning witnesses to his divinity, wherein he reminds them that by law it takes two to prove or disprove a testimony, which in his case, the two witnesses are his heavenly father and himself. We know that establishing Jesus's identity as the only begotten Son of God, Israel's Messiah, is John's purpose for writing his gospel. And based on that, we can presume that the story of the woman caught in adultery has more to do with Christ's identity than her predicament. Now, the discussion about the requirement of true witnesses in chapter 8 not only hawks back to the incident of the adulteress, who had not been afforded any, as we will read, but much more so to the false witness of the scribes and Pharisees who denied Jesus' true identity as God's Messiah. So we can say up to this point that the theme of true witness against the false, the truth revealed by Jesus about himself, Contrasted with the false testimony the religious leaders were holding against him, continues from chapter 7 through the account of the woman caught in adultery to the end of chapter 8, where he reveals the truth of who he is in no uncertain terms, declaring, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, verse 58. And this is one of the eight I am declarations of Jesus found only in John's gospel, where he equates himself to Jehovah, Father God, who sent him to save sinners. Now, this incident of the woman caught in adultery took place in Jerusalem in one of the temple courts during the Jewish calendar of Tishrei, mid-September to mid-October, during the Feast of Tabernacles and six months before his crucifixion. And we know that when Jesus and his disciples were in Jerusalem, it was an observance of the feast in keeping with Mosaic law, as he always had. Otherwise, he spent most of his three and a half year ministry in the Galilee and surrounding areas where he was more welcomed. Now, they had just come from the Mount of Olives, where they had spent the night, as they often had to avoid the crowds. And that morning, Jesus began to teach at the temple, most likely in the court of women, where everyone could gather. And he would have done so, given that he did not exclude women from his teaching. 
and it was in that court that cases were tried, specifically in the Nicanor Gate that opened up into the court, where the accused and witnesses were brought together for judgment, with the names and offense of the accused written in the dust on the ground before them. Not wanting offenses to be permanently written anywhere in the temple precinct, they were written in the dust where they would be easily blown away. So it is likely that Jesus' encounter with the woman caught in adultery and her accusers occurred at one or at or around the Nicanor Gate. That all said, let's begin to read the account from John chapter 8, verse 2 from the New King James Version. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. John 8, 4. Notice here that they informed Jesus that the woman had been caught in the very act of adultery, which was a stipulation of judicial procedure in Mosaic law. And I quote from Deuteronomy 22:22, 22, 22, where it says, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. Also note that they called Jesus teacher, didaskale in the Greek, comparable to rabbi in the Hebrew, a title of distinction. Yet it is unlikely they afforded him that title behind his back, since they despised him and his teachings. This show of respect was surely meant to flatter him in order to lure him into their trap. And in verse 5, the scribes and Pharisees allude to that statute, saying, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This is from Deuteronomy 22, verses 23 and 24. Now, although for most of us this punishment does not fit the crime, the Jews understood how critical it was that there be no sin in Israel from the hard lessons they had learned in their 40-year wilderness period, when survival depended on God's presence remaining with them. If sin had been tolerated, God's presence would have departed and all of the Hebrews would have perished before they reached the land of promise. And the first century Jews held to this, particularly since Israel had remained under foreign domination from the time of the Babylonian invasion of Judah in 587 BC, when Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed, largely due to sin having been tolerated by both the royal and religious leadership. So they lived in fear that if there was any tolerance of sin among them, the Jews, God would once again have their temple destroyed and the measure of local autonomy allowed by Rome taken away. And continuing in verse 6 of our story, John wrote, This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, John gives no indication as to what Jesus wrote in the dust, nor does he tell us why he initially was silent. But what is evident is that he was not going to be led into the trap of condemning the woman to death. Had Jesus done so, he would have been guilty of breaching Roman law, which forbids citizens to execute criminals. If he had incriminated himself on those grounds, they would have turned him over to the officials and he would have paid the price for it. So we can say that Jesus remained silent for whatever he might have said about her case could have been used against him. Yet had they truly known Jesus's heart, they would have known that he would not condemn the woman. For as John Lid wrote of him, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3.17 And about Jesus writing in the dust with his finger, I take it that there is something self-revelatory in it that can be recognized. And that is, 
Jesus as the Son of God through whom everything was created, the one who established the nation of Israel through Jacob's progeny, the one who led his people out of Egyptian bondage, the one who gave the law on Mount Sinai, inscribing the Ten Commandments on two tablets with his own finger. And returning to our story in verse 7, it says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. In verse 8, it continues to say, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. It is amazing that although the scribes and Pharisees were attempting to draw Jesus into condemning the woman, it is they who are condemned by none less than their own conscience, not only from what he said, but possibly from what he wrote in the dust. And in verse 10, our story concludes with, And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. And he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now what appears to be absent here is Jesus telling her that she had been forgiven, which she had done for others. Yet we have heard it said so often that this story is a demonstration of Christ's mercy and forgiveness. Instead of forgiving the woman, the story abruptly ends with him urging her to sin no more. Could it be that in spite of the ordeal she had just suffered, that she did not repent in her heart of her adultery? If this was the case, Jesus could not have forgiven her. Unfortunately, we don't know what happened to the woman Jesus saved from certain death that morning. And it is to wonder if she had heard about another mock trial, that of Jesus's before the Sanhedrin, the night before his crucifixion, or if she had been in the crowd when he was sentenced to death by Pontius Pilate, or had witnessed him carrying his crossbeam through the streets of Jerusalem on the way to Golgotha. Yet what is certain is that she had an encounter with the judge of all judges, who will come in the end to judge the world. The divine judge who wrote the law and punishments for those who break it and who has the power to execute it or to acquit. Now let's examine the possible answers to that most often raised question, what was Jesus writing in the dust? But bear in mind that John does not indicate that any had read what Jesus had been writing, but responded from what they heard him say. This is not to say that some had not looked over his shoulder to see what he was writing, but that we just can't say for sure that he had. Now, I have found five plausible answers to our question, which might help you to decide for yourselves what Jesus actually wrote in the dust that morning. Beginning with the first and most popular suggestion is that Jesus was writing the Ten Commandments in order to appeal to the conscience of her accusers, knowing that they had broken some, if not all of them. And as you know, it is the belief in Judaism that if you break one commandment, you have essentially broken all of them. This answer is a good choice since it corresponds to Jesus' challenge that whoever among them is without sin, that is, breaking God's commandments, that he should be the one to cast the first stone at her. And keeping the commandments was essential to Jesus of Nazareth, who was a Torah observant Jew, faithful to the commandments of God, who upheld the law. He did not let either the woman or the hypocritical religious leaders off the hook. And let me say here that for those who take it that this story was meant to illustrate Jesus's leniency or even nullification of the law, need to rethink that, for he is clearly upholding the law in this episode. And why wouldn't he? 
as mentioned above. He is the author of it. Jesus asserted, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till it is all fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17. And since the heaven and earth still exist, the law must stand. And the second suggestion further relates to Jesus' upholding of the law, uh, that of which her accusers had obviously broken. And that is, he wrote Deuteronomy 22:22 22 in the dust, mentioned in part above, and I quote in full, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die, the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. Having not brought forward her partner in adultery, they incriminated themselves. Also, there was a breach of another related statute, and that is of the required number of witnesses. And I quote from Deuteronomy 19.15, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Not wanting to be exposed for breaking the law as they obviously had done, writing these two statutes in the dust would have put them under conviction, as they had been and cause them to drop their stones and leave. And the third suggestion is that Jesus wrote the Roman law forbidding execution by citizens. Since the Jewish Judicial Council of the Sanhedrin had been stripped of their power to execute offenders, evident in not having executed Jesus themselves in Jerusalem, it is likely that they were attempting to draw Jesus into incriminating himself by initiating the stoning, a blatant defiance of Roman law. In this way, the scribes and Pharisees would have killed two birds with one stone, the law-breaking adulteress and Jesus of Nazareth, who refused to obey their man-made laws. And the fourth suggestion is that even without knowing what Jesus had written, the Pharisees and scribes might have been reminded of what the prophet Jeremiah had foretold. And I quote him, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah 17:13. This scripture was read every year at Yom Kippur, which took place just days before this incident. So it would have been fresh in their minds. And so they would have been more likely to have been brought under conviction if they thought Jesus had been writing their names in the dust for having broken the law, which in their case was the laws governing trials and whatever other laws they were guilty of breaching. And let me say here that Jeremiah's prophecy speaks of the Lord as the hope of Israel, pointing to God's Messiah, who will write the names of the guilty in the earth. So perhaps this was a subtle way of Jesus revealing to the Jews that he is God's Messiah, that which is at the heart of John's Gospel. And then there is the fifth and last option, which relates to the first one, of having written the Ten Commandments in the dust. Instead, he wrote the commandment most relevant to the mock trial of the adulteress, and that is the Ninth Commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Exodus 20, 16. And how had her accusers transgressed this commandment? by not having two witnesses and not bringing forth her partner in adultery. In this regard, we can say that she had been set up, although this is not to say that she was innocent, for we know according to Jesus that she was not, but that due process of the law had been denied her. 
Given that there were no witnesses, it is possible that either her husband, who could not find two witnesses to testify against her, had the scribes and Pharisees come and seize her and lie about witnesses having caught her in the act. Yet more probable, since they knew of the woman's adulterous activity, they seized her on their own in order to use her and their ploy to incriminate Jesus. Whatever happened, they gave false testimony that she had been caught in the act. And due to that, Jesus, who like any righteous judge, acquitted her on the technicality of her accuser's false testimony. And when they dropped their stones and abandoned their mock trial, it was another technicality for her acquittal. Now, in regard to the actual message the author wanted us to grasp from this episode, I take it that it was the revelation of who Jesus is, the true judge, who in the end will judge between the righteous and the guilty. And he is the truth, as he declared. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Now, I hope this study has helped you to decide for yourself the author's intent of the story and what Jesus wrote in the dust. But even more importantly, I hope that you have gained a greater understanding about Christ's character, nature, and mission, knowing him better in order to live a life pleasing to him. And isn't that why we study the scriptures? Thank you for viewing, and I pray that you will continue to immerse yourselves in the scriptures and that the Lord Jesus Christ will bless you accordingly in every area of your lives.